Welcome back to Podcast 47 of 2021. I'm your host, Kiev O'Neill. You can follow me on Twitter at OBKiev. Follow us at The Oddsbreakers and follow us on social media slash The Oddsbreakers. This episode is being brought to you by footballcontest.com. To get into the Las Vegas Super Contest and the Circus Sports Million or Survivor, please check out Maddie over at footballcontest.com to get your picks in from anywhere around the country or or even anywhere around the world. If you'd like to help us out with our costs and sponsor the website and podcast, we'd love to help you out. Please visit theoddsbreakers.com, click shop, and become a member. For $24.99 a month, you can get my plays and premium plays before the line moves. Also check out our other handicappers, and if nothing else, Please visit theazbreakers.com and become a free picks newsletter subscriber. My friends, we have a great show for you today. And I'm going solo. And the reason that is, is because I think I found some great information for you guys for the NFL preseason, how to bet the preseason, and how to insure free money from a free sports book deposit bonus bet. There's a way to guarantee yourself free money when they give you a free bet for depositing, and I'm going to go over that in this episode. I actually covered that a little bit last year as well for another listener named Chris that had some questions about it. I do it in more depth and more detail throughout this episode. So stay tuned for all that, because before I get into that, I wanted to quick mention the Oklahoma in Texas deal. It's looking that it was a heck of a lot more than noise when about a week ago it was reported that Texas and Oklahoma were toying to get over to the SEC. It's They pretty much told the Big 12 they are not renewing their 2024-2025 agreements. Now, whatever the SEC told them, obviously worked because this is a massive move for them. And I don't know even know how much more money they're going to make from the SEC, but it's obvious that the SEC has the deal with ESPN and Disney that helps boost their product up. Well, let's say a massive percent, right? We, we don't know what that number is, but when the biggest sports network for talking about sports, grading sports, rating sports, telling you who's good and telling you who's bad, owns a conference pretty much. Well, (laughs) you know that that conference is going to be told to you that they're the best. And that's already started happening, obviously, but now it's going to happen with more teams. And maybe the Big 12 couldn't bring that kind of power, obviously, because they didn't have to deal with Disney, ESPN. And the SEC is able to grant that to them, which is going to obviously be more attractive to the best football players and basketball players, right? I mean, think of it what you want, but that's the whole the whole deal. They're trying to make a super conference, and they have the monopoly to do it. They have the backing to do it. The people that you watch will tell you they're the greatest team, so they will in turn, be ranked higher. Now, you can be happy with that if you're an SEC fan, I guess, right? Who knows what's going to happen? But um, this just kind of further puts the rest of the college football landscape down. And it also makes me wonder if some of the rumors are true that the SEC is kind of trying to start their own Premier League. I mean, if the SEC becomes unhappy with (laughs) the way playoffs are treated or if the way that uh, non-conference games are treated or anything, they could just completely bail on everybody and just say, we're just doing our own league and we're going to be the true national champions. Now, of course, other leagues can say we're the national champions and you're all of a sudden back into some massive shit show that you had uh, (laughs) before the BCS. But, I mean, it's all about money. And the SEC is going to make a lot more money when they bring the viewers from Texas and from Oklahoma 
into their conference, right? And every other conference is probably going to be inferior because they don't have some massive sports network talking about how good they are. I mean, this is about control, total control. Is it right? I mean, not for competition, not for any Big Ten team that's left there, right? I mean, if Michigan and Ohio State were smart, they'd try to do the same thing if this goes through. I mean, it almost kind of puts a big detractor between everything. Now, rather, if it's right or wrong for competition, why should they care anyway? Because nobody's going to stop them, right? I mean, it does you no good if you went to Indiana, right? It, it doesn't do you any good if you went to USC or Oregon, at least not right now, unless the plan is for those teams to eventually jump on board as well. But this thing's all about power and control. Disney's going to control who's good and who's not or who's perceived as good as not in the SEC conference. And that's just going to continue it when they keep expanding. And they're going to make all the money from college football. So, I mean, that's how it is. Uh, you can complain, you can do whatever you want, but the government exactly doesn't, hasn't been busting too many monopolies up lately. So good luck with that if you're from any of those other schools. But in the meantime, I personally as a Badger fan hate it. Um, it's something that I kind of foresaw. There's some weakness in the Big Ten with some of the leadership there. And uh, you know, hopefully uh, some people in the boosters there get their acts together and maybe try to clean house and you know, try to figure out who's best to run some of the other conferences, including the Big Ten, like I just mentioned. You know, maybe maybe they can get together and figure something out better. But as far as right now, I mean, there's a regime that's completely taking over here, and it's literally about the money. And if you don't join, you will be left in the dust. I mean, that's kind of what I see. But at the same time, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And uh, you know, if I was wrong somewhere, please tell me. I'm, more than happy to have a debate with you or talk to you about it or see if I missed something. You know, I'm not perfect. So uh, if you want to talk about the SEC and the expansion of their league, I'd love to hear what you have to say. All right, let's get into how to guarantee a profit or a payout from a sports books free bet deposit bonus. So over the years, and including today, there are sports books out there that will give you a free bet, right? Instead of a different type of deposit bonus. Now, there's deposit bonuses that might give you half your deposit up to $500 or, or up to $1,000, just depends. And they will offer you a rollover. Like, it'll be like 12 times rollover, 16 times rollover, 20 times rollover. Well, to roll over your bankroll that many times takes a very long time to do. And they are betting against you, you know, thinking that you're going to make some bad bets and end up losing it before you're allowed to take any money out anyways, right? It's kind of the way they do things. But instead, sometimes they just offer a free bet. So you can get the money right away and you can possibly only roll it over once or twice or just roll over the bet once or twice. You know, that's that's kind of like how these sports books are operating right now. You know, many times they expect you to lose that bet or maybe you take some huge favorite and only get a smaller percentage of that bet. Right. I mean, you have a 50 50 shot of making, for example, if you use five hundred dollars, four hundred fifty four dollars and fifty five cents at the minus one ten. You know, let's say it's a perfect line, 50% chance on this side, 50% chance on this side. They're really offering you $455 or $0, right? That, I mean, that's the only two options. Now, instead of taking $0 or taking a chance, maybe you just deposited $500 and got the $500 bet. I don't know. Depends what sports book you're doing. There's a much better way to approach this, Right. And the best way to approach it is to do a staggered parlay, right? Now, if you stagger a parlay, what that means is that you bet a game before the next game happens. You don't want to happen them at the same time. So, for example, you can bet like the Chicago Bears at noon on Sunday, 
and then you can bet the Monday night game as well, right? And obviously, if you parlay your $500, it would pay a lot more than just, for example, like two to one on two different bets. And that is a good way to approach this free play. Most of them allow you to do this bet. So there's a calculation that you can do to guarantee money off of a deposit bet. By staggering it, you can go the other way on each game, right? You like guarantees? I like guarantees. This is definitely the best way to approach it. So the average deposit bonus, like I said, about $500. And so I'm going to use that number. So instead of, you know, making that bet, much better way to do it. I'm going to use the minus 110 juice in our calculations because that's just, you know, the normal number that you get out there in most cases for football betting. So after the parlay bet's been made, we hedge on the other side at the minus 110 to guarantee your profit. If your hedge loses, then you have to bet even more money the next time to cover the first bet as well as the second bet and still make that amount of profit. There's a break even point where you make the same amount of money every single time. It's like the maximum payout that you can make without risking anything else. And there's an equation for that and it's called the max profit equation. X plus Y equals your payout, right? Your total payout. Now, because this is a parlay, you have to do X plus Y plus Z equals your total payout. So at minus 110 juice, you're getting $1,320 from your $500 parlay bet. In this equation, the X and Y are, are variables that are related to each other. And the Z is the total of the, those two variables with respect to the rate which we know is minus 110 or 1.1. For us, really, in simple terms, Z is your second bet, right? X is your first bet, and Y is your guaranteed profit. Y is basically what you're going to be making. Whatever your bet is, divided by the 1.1, because that's the rate you're doing, right? If I bet something, you divide it by 1.1 to get your payout at minus 110. So being that we're solving for why basically, or your max profit, I'm just going to transpose the equation 1320 minus C minus X equals Y. Now, before you fall asleep, and for all you people that are about to fast forward this segment, I am going to send this out in an article a little bit later today so you can kind of see for yourself and do your own calculation. Now, if you want me to do it for you, feel free to tweet me at the Ozbreakers if this is the deposit bonus that you are actually getting. Not a problem, but I'm going to quick go through the boring math for you so you can kind of figure it out. So basically with that equation, 1300 minus Z minus X equals Y or 1320, whatever. Y is just a function of X. It's X over 1.1, like I said before, but what Z is, Z is X plus Y. It's those two together plus another rate of 1.1 because you have to cover your loss and the second bet. So after seeing what Y and Z are, it's, you, you basically simplify the equation, right? Because there's just X's in the equation since Y equals X over 1.1. It comes up at 1320 minus bracketed X plus X over 1.1. And then you have 1.1 above the bracket minus X equals X over 1.1, right? Obviously, simplify that equation. And in this article, I'm kind of writing out how you simplify it. It's pretty simple if you remember your high school algebra x ends up being $329.25 this is the amount of your first bet at minus 110 to get your maximum profit of $299.32 so as you see here if you get a $500 free bet instead of trying for something plus money you can guarantee that you're going to make $299.32, no matter what. After solving the equation, it looks like 1320 
minus 69142, which would be your second bet if that 329 first bet loses. Minus the 329.26 equals 299.32. In summary, once you lose that first bet, 691.42 is placed on the second bet. And you at minus 110, you get paid 628.56, minus out your first bet of 329.26, and you get 299.32. It's actually 299.30 because there's more decimals that I rounded off, but still about the same. So basically, this is a much better way than taking a chance with your free bet. You're guaranteeing yourself money. Now, if you wanted to do it the lazy way, there's a way just to make $216. It's basically X plus Y equals $454.55. That way, you just have to bet two thirty-eight and nine cents. 238.09 to make $216.45. But why would you take $216 when you can make $299.32 just by doing a staggered parlay? So that's my recommendation if you ever get a free bet to play it like this. And if you forget about it, you can always check the oddsbreakers.com. I'm actually going to put this on bets info the bets and info section on our website, bets, info, and trends actually. So you can reference it anytime that you need. All right, my friends, for the next section here, we're going to get into NFL preseason betting and coaching records. This segment is being sponsored by mybookie.ag for a 50% sign up bonus. Please visit my booking and use the promo code odds, breakers, terms, conditions, and locations apply. Now that preseason's right around the corner, no better way to start prepping is to start looking at the data. Now, obviously, a lot of people have their own ideas about breading preseason sports in general, but football is a little bit different. Now, there's a lot of coaching changes. There's quarterback changes. There's different preseason goals for teams, right? There's a shorter preseason this year. There's new coordinators. But the most important factor to me remains motivation. And that's actually the most important factor in preseason football. It's coaching philosophy, the single most important factor. It's imperative to know what they did in the past if you have that data available. Now, the biggest issue here is that since the 2019 football season, there's been a lot of coaching changes and no preseason games due to COVID last year, right? So a lot of coaches don't have data points, but that doesn't change my philosophy for what I know and the data that I have, right? New coaches coming in in general are kind of a coin flip in most cases, except the first game. And I'm going to say this in general because it's not true for all coaches. But in general, the first preseason game a coach has, he if he's new, he likes to try to win that game. It just kind of sets the tone for the season. But if they're playing a team that I'm not sure that, that I think might try to win, I probably wouldn't be betting on them. So it's just kind of something to think about. Another thing I like to look at is quarterback competition. If there's really an open competition and the number and the two top guys, qualifiers, whatever you want to call them, the, the guys on the depth chart are going against each other, then that's something to look at too because there's more motivation for them to obviously take the reins. So that's a big thing I look at. But getting back to the aspect of what's important these coaches are extremely important, right? And also sample size. I personally have to have at least eight games played or two full seasons of preseason football to make a determination on a coach. Obviously, the more data, the better. But as I said earlier, looking at what these coaches did is the most important thing. And some court coaches are very bullish on winning these preseason games that have 
zero significance to what their record's going to be at the end of the season. And some coaches do not care whatsoever and will be instead looser in their play calling and looser who they put in to play the game. So basically, coaches that want to win, they're going to play a lot of their good first, second, and third stringers. If they think a third stringer is going to make the team, they're going to play him more than a coach that wouldn't, right? And they're probably going to determine if their lower tier players is going to make the team during their OTAs. They're also going to stick to their playbook that works. Maybe a couple extra plays in there, but they're not going to be afraid of showing their hand in the preseason because I, I suppose maybe their coaching philosophy or playbook hasn't changed that much anyway. Other coaches that don't care at all about winning will tend to play their worst players to determine if they will make the team during the preseason games rather than in practice or OTAs, right? So these bearish coaches will also try a lot of new plays that they came up over the offseason. They're going to try to do them in the actual preseason game rather than just in OTAs, just in general. So... The good news for you, or for me, or for hopefully anybody listening to this podcast, is that I have all the data since at least 2003 of how these coaches do in the preseason, and I'm going to share some of that with you. And even better news, I'm going to share it all with you in this article that we'll be releasing this week at theoddsbreakers.com. All right. But just to start out, the most winning coaches who will be paying my bills. Number one is Mike Zimmer from the Vikings. Mike Zimmer is 20 and five at 80%. I guess his philosophy is that losing is for suckers. You are one pathetic loser. So Mike Zimmer is at the top, but at a close second, is Mr. John Harbaugh at 37 and 12 at 76%. All he does is win. All I do is win, 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 no matter what. And number three is Mr. John Gruden at 37 and 17 at 69%. For Chucky, winning football games is like child's play. Now going to the most losing coaches in the preseason that will also help me pay some bills number one mike vrabel two and six at 25 percent why do things that you can put off until later number two matt Nagy, three and six at 33 percent how can we win if pace is picking our players And Andy Reid at 39 and 45 at 46%. If cheeseburgers are not involved, then why even bother? All right. So those are your most winning and your most losing coaches in the preseason with a sample size of eight or more. And with so many coaches getting fired, you know, they're some of the good ones are gone to fade. Jason Garrett was a Unfortunately, one of those that is gone who was 14 and 22, right? And Matt Patricia wasn't doing so good. I think he was one in seven or two in six. I can't remember, but he was one of those that was a nice fade. Anthony Lynn at three and nine was also one as well. So unfortunately, We lost them, but we can still bet on some of these other coaches. But wait, there's more. I also break down what these coaches have done during the preseason on a week-to-week basis, all right? Because some coaches care more in the beginning of the preseason, and some coaches care more at the end. That's important to know, right? For example, John Harbaugh is 12-1 and one in game ones. And I think his only loss in the first game of the preseason was his first year coaching. 
but he's seven and five in game fours. So maybe for John Harbaugh, you're a little bit more careful game four. Bill Belichick, 66% on week one at 14 and seven, but only eight and 12 in game fours. On the flip side, Mike Tomlin is only seven and eight in game one, but eight and five on game fours. Catch my drift? Some of these coaches in this article do different things on different weeks. And when it comes to betting on them or fading them, it's important to know that. Now, you're probably asking, why isn't it against the spread records? Well, the reason that is, is because preseason in general is they're usually covering when they're winning, right? The coaches are usually completely playing garbage players or they're not. And Vegas doesn't know that. The bookmakers don't know that. So you see a bunch of spreads of less than three. I mean, it's pretty rare to see one above three. So you're pretty safe to bet a team below the three anyway, or you can just take them on the money line if you're not sure, or even do both. In general, the teams that are winning in the preseason are covering the spread. That's just in general. So that's important to know. The last bit of information to know is that how come you are doing this when the preseason has been taken down to three weeks? Well, the answer is that there's still a first week and there's still a last week and there's still the ones in the middle. For next year, I'm probably going to have to add up weeks two and three just to match what they're doing as long as they keep the three weeks going i think they'll keep them going for a little while in the near in the foreseeable future anyway and so you kind of kind of know what they want to do at the beginning and at the end a lot of coaches at the end don't want to risk injury some coaches at the end are like man this team looked like crap throughout the preseason or they're just not ready let's play and go into the season with a win with momentum So that's definitely something to look at as well. You know, what are they doing at the end? What are their goals? And that's why it's really important to look at these numbers, in my opinion. If you have any questions about that or any of these charts on these coaches, please feel free to tweet me at the odds breakers. But I'm going to give you a play for NFL preseason week one. And this one should be obvious to you. We are going to go with the Baltimore Ravens minus two and a half. And yes, you're laying minus 125 against the New Orleans Saints. Now, do I love it? The fact that there's a quarterback controversy. I don't love that, but I still think it's worth a three-star play. Because if you look at Sean Payton, his preseason record is 28 and 29. Doesn't care quite as much, right? If you look at Sean Payton, week one, he's about eight and eight. Sean Payton goes very hard on week three. Plays his starters a lot longer. 11 and three in week three, but we're not at week three. But just remember, I said that for week three. And then the last week, Sean Payton is three and 11. But if you're going to go against a guy that is 12 and one, On week one, I'm pretty sure John Harbaugh is going to do what it takes to win this first preseason game, and you are getting this under the three. I think that's very important, and I think this is definitely a play for about three stars. Duh. Winning. My friends, if you have any other questions about how we bet the preseason or about any of these coaches, feel free to tweet us at the Odds Breakers. I hope you have a great rest of your week. I want to remind you that we are doing two podcasts a week here on out all the way through the college football and NFL season. Also want to remind you that there are free plays at the odds breakers. Check us out daily. Have a great rest of your week and go get some winners.